Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day five of South by Southwest. Please welcome to the stage Garrett DeVink and Molly White. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Garrett DeVink. I'm a tech reporter at The Washington Post. I live in San Francisco. It's very good to be here escaping the rain. Um, and this is Molly White. I don't know if you want to just introduce yourself, because I'm sure there are a few people who still don't, who maybe don't really know like who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Molly White. Uh, I run a website called Web3 is Going Just Great. Uh, where I track some of the ways that the crypto industry uh, and Web3 and blockchain-based projects have sort of failed to live up to some of the very lofty promises that we were presented with uh, a couple years ago and sort of going into the present day. Um, so yeah, so I got to know Molly a little bit, I guess, last year because I wrote a story about you um, because you know, as a tech reporter for like the last decade, obviously crypto has been kind of on the periphery, sometimes a little bit more central, sometimes going back to the periphery. And I hadn't written about it that much because I was just, I felt like you really needed to dive into it to be able to have the authority to write skeptical stories, to write, you know, stories that really got into it, that helped people understand it in a real way. Um, and so I honestly had kind of avoided the space. And then I think the last couple of years during the pandemic when so much more money was being involved, so many people who had never invested in crypto were doing that for the first time, were you know, getting into Web3, were asking questions about what that meant. Um, I think Molly for a lot of people was sort of someone to, who helped us understand like what to look for and, and um, the, even the kinds of questions to ask. So I'm, I think, Maybe if you could tell me a bit about your background, like what did you do before you, you started the site and before you stepped into this role? Sure. Um, so my background is really in software. Um, so I was working in the software industry for six years or so before I started the site. Um, and I was a web software engineer, um, which is partly why I was so interested in you know crypto and blockchains and things is that you know, the real story behind the recent resurgence of crypto was this thing called Web3. And, you know, as a software engineer who was working in the web space, I thought, you know, well, I'm, I should be, you know, keeping up with my industry. If this is the future of the web, you know, I should be up to date with that. Um, so that was sort of what got me into it and interested in it is I really just wanted to make sure I was you know, knowledgeable about what was going on. Um, but I'm also someone who's always been really fascinated and, you know, interested in the web in general, just as, you know, I, I've been a Wikipedia editor since I was like 13 years old. It's like the weirdest hobby for a little kid to have, but that's me. Um, and so, you know, and that is a very sort of idealistic, ideological project around, you know, open knowledge and making sure that people have access to information and, and things like that. And so, you know, the, the future of the web is something I've always really cared about, um, partly because of that. And so when I heard that, oh, the, you know, the future of the web is going to be blockchains, I was like, all right, let's figure it out, you know, and then I started to research it and, and sort of form my opinion after that. What is Web3? <laughs> yeah, that's the question, right? I mean, so Web3, more than anything, is a marketing term. I think that's really important to realize is that, like, crypto kind of was passe, especially when people really started to associate the term with, you know, um, buying drugs online or, uh, you know, the ICO bubble or whatever it was. And so Web3 was this shiny new marketing term for something that had been around for a little while. Um, but people started to use it to describe just the general subject of, you know, anything that you do online with a blockchain, you know, so your social network, but with a blockchain, uh, is really what Web3 is. Um, but, you know, it was, it's very effective in making people think that, you know, this is the next one. You know, people know that current web is Web2, you know, what's Web3? Oh, well, it must be this. So how did you specifically decide to start Web3 is going just great. I mean, what like, like what precipitated that, and and then what were the first early steps of building that site? So when I started to research Web three and blockchains and crypto more broadly, despite the name of the site, it is actually sort of broadly based in you know on blockchains and things like that. 
um, I, I sort of formed this opinion on it that I was, you know, I was seeing the, the coverage in the media and a lot of the talk on social media that was like, everyone should be buying crypto, you should be speculating on Dogecoin, you know, you should be uh, quitting your job in software and going and starting a crypto project or like being a community moderator or whatever for a crypto project. You know, it was, this was in like late 2021 when things were just insane. I mean, it was like the hype cycle had reached its true peak. Um, and I was seeing that side of things, but then I was also seeing this other side of things that was usually much more ephemeral. It was like, I would see tweets about something, you know, oh, a project just got hacked or, oh, geez, this guy just lost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of his savings because he didn't realize that he had, you know, downloaded the wrong MetaMask extension and it was actually malware. Um, and those were not getting the media attention at the time. It was all like headlines around, you know, like, look, this artist uh, was like, you know, struggling to get by and now their NFT project has made them millionaires or whatever. So it felt like there was a huge gap in the coverage and people were only seeing the positive stuff that was like, buy crypto, buy crypto. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, as a Wikipedia editor, this is something that I am used to doing is like writing about something that needs more attention. But, you know, um, Dogecoin Shiba Inu token is often not notable enough for a Wikipedia article. You know, these like one-off projects that sort of emerge, they get really popular and then they rug pull or whatever. Like that's not going to be notable enough for a Wikipedia article. Plus I have really strong opinions on it, obviously. Uh, also not great for Wikipedia. You're not supposed to go and use it as like an advocacy platform. So I, it was pretty clear from the beginning that I wasn't going to be able to write Wikipedia articles about it, which was kind of my normal thing. Uh, so I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just do my own thing. I, it didn't, I guess it just didn't occur to me that like freelance journalism is a thing. Maybe it just like kind of wasn't something that occurred to me. Uh, so I, I had created the sort of timeline style website that I use for Web3 is going just great in like a previous life. I had used it for something else. And so it was just kind of sitting around. And so I, I just started doing it. And honestly, I thought it was going to be one of those like dumb little projects that I make that's just for me and my own entertainment and maybe like I send it to a friend who also thinks crypto is kind of dumb and like they think it's funny and then I go back to my day job um but it ended up being a little more popular than I expected um and I should say we are probably going to take we are going to take questions near the oh, end yes. and there's a you can upload the questions through the app and then like vote on which questions and we'll be able to see them if if y'all are interested um I mean do you consider yourself a journalist then right now? I don't. I honestly, I think I consider myself m like a Wikipedia article or editor. So, um, you know, like writing a Wikipedia article is not journalism necessarily. You're not going out and like interviewing primary sources. You're not, you know, getting into the weeds yourself as much. You're usually aggregating information from other locations and then publishing it in one sort of central location, which is largely what the site does. I do do research on some of these projects and obviously, you know, sometimes you do just have to get in there on Etherscan or whatever and see what's going on. Um, but for the most part, I'm not the one, you know, doing the like deep dive investigations just because when you're publishing like one to four uh, stories a day, it's, it's just not sustainable for me to be the one like muckraking. <laughs> um, I, so you did quit your job, right? I mean, you at, at the end of the day, right? So yeah. is this like, are you doing this full time or, and, and, and I think, I mean, that's probably a theme that a lot of people are interested in, you know, something that started as maybe a side project, maybe a passion project or a hobby becoming the main thing. And I'm like, how did you think about that in terms of financial security and like, you know, stepping out and doing that for yourself? So, as much as I would like to say it was this like well thought out plan, um, it was not. I So I ended up, like I said, I, I worked in software for six years. I was at the same company for six years, um, basically straight out of college. And so that kind of felt like it was coming to its natural end already. Um, and, you know, through the pandemic, I had been um, probably working too hard, you know, and was putting in more hours than I should have been. And things were a little crazy at work. And I was just kind of burnt out at work. 
Um, and so I ended up deciding, um, well, so I ended up taking a sabbatical from my job because my company was one of those ones where like, if you work there for five years, you get the one month to take as a sabbatical. I did that. And I was like, that was amazing. I need more of that. And so I was like, I think I'm just going to quit my job and do that for a couple of months. And so I basically was like, I'm going to take the summer off and then I'm going to get another software job and that will be that. And then I quit my job and it's like I couldn't relax. <laughs> it's like I am just not good at sitting and doing nothing. And so I ended up just focusing on the site a lot. Obviously, um, you know, early sort of spring to summer of 2022, there was a lot happening in the crypto industry. You know, that's when um, Three Arrows Capital blew up, the handful of crypto bankruptcies. You know, it was like just a lot of stuff was happening. So I ended up focusing a lot on the site during that time. And, you know, at that point, journalists had started reaching out to me. I was going on podcasts, stuff like that. So by the end of the summer, when it was time to actually, like, get back into reality and, like, figure out how I was going to pay the bills, I had to decide, you know, do I want to go back into software full time and go back to doing this on, like, nights and weekends, which was kind of a scary proposition given how much time I was putting into it. You know, it was going to be, like, having two full-time jobs, kind of. Or, you know, do I find a way to make this sustainable so I can keep doing this as my primary focus? Um, and I ended up just getting kind of lucky, honestly. Um, so I started a Substack um, so that I could, you know, start doing some longer form writing, which was something I had wanted to do anyway. And, you know, people were interested in that and it did get some traction. I don't think it would have been enough to, you know, sustain me full time, but, you know, it got some attention. Um, and then I ended up joining the Library, library Innovation Lab um, at Harvard, which is a part of their Harvard Law School library. Um, because they are really interested in topics around, um, like, archiving, online archiving, um, you know, decentralized file storage is kind of adjacent to a lot of their interests. And so just having someone who is very familiar with crypto and some of these sort of crypto adjacent topics around like IPFS and things like that, um, I think was, in, you know, useful and, and aligned with their interests. So they basically gave me a year long fellowship to get me through until November and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think you know, a, a lot of people would consider what you do, I guess, citizen journalism, which is a weird term because I'm a citizen too. But I mean, I, and I think crypto specifically, if we look at what happened with um, FTX and Sam Bankman Fried, a lot of those stories were broken by non traditional, non legacy publications, at least initially. Or, you know, I think even just a lot of news that is quote unquote broken by big mainstream news organizations, they, you know, we get our tips on Twitter, right? It's, it's, you know, maybe not that different from having a bunch of sources and calling them on the phone, having a bunch of weird people you follow on Twitter and seeing what they say, but it's still public and there is more people saying, hey, this is information I think would be valuable for other people. Let me put it out there and see what happens. And um, I, I, I'm just, especially now that the mainstream um, news world has sort of turned its eye away from crypto because of the crash in prices and there's other shiny objects for us to chase. I mean, what do you think the role of citizen journalism has in covering this space going forward? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because citizen journalism in crypto is like particularly prominent, I feel like. There's a lot of people who really focus on it. Um, and I think it's something that just emerges naturally because in order to cover crypto, you have to be like pretty in it, which I think is just challenging to some extent for you know tech journalists or, or even journalists who have a wider beat than that um, because like you have other things you have to pay attention to and you can't necessarily learn how to like you know, dig through the blockchain and records and things like that. Um, and so people just sort of get into it. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's valuable. I think sort of citizen journalism in the crypto space is valuable. I also think mainstream journalism in the crypto space is valuable. And I think the two sort of need to work together to some extent. Um, a lot of people, you know, I think basically a lot of journalists don't necessarily have the crypto knowledge that some of the citizen journalists do. And I think a lot of the citizen journalists don't have the journalism knowledge that you know, mainstream press might have. So you see weaknesses in both where, you know, mainstream coverage will have gaps in how they talk about some of the more technical stuff sometimes. But, you know, the citizen journalism will have gaps in, you know, how rigorously they are checking their sourcing or how willing they are to really just run with a rumor. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the two sort of complement each other, I think. And, and when you're working in the space and when you're researching stuff, you have to end up getting a very, um, sort of careful understanding of, you know, which crypto publications are actually reliable, which of these like anonymous crypto accounts are probably, you know, publishing from good sources versus just speculating. Um, you know, you end up having to get this very like deep understanding of who is doing what, um, which is, I think, challenging for the outsider sometimes. Um, I want to ask about the sort of FTX story because it's obviously like kind of the biggest example. And for those who don't know, FTX was kind of probably the most respected, at least in mainstream circles, crypto exchange uh, that was based in the US at least. And uh, CEO Sam Bankman-Fried was, you know, someone who was very popular among mainstream journalists, mainstream politicians. He had a lot of, he spent a lot of time communicating with the non-crypto world, I would say, and he uh, donated a lot of his money to causes that that he was passionate about, and sort of had been built up a public profile as someone as a philanthropist in a lot of ways. And then, um, you know, it turned out that essentially the whole exchange was had no internal controls, and you can debate whether he was a criminal from the start or whether he was a kid who gotten over his head. But um, you know, he's now potentially facing some very serious jail time, depending on how his his trial goes for fraud. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, what is your post-mortem of the media coverage of FTX and, and Sam Bankman-Fried and, and what ended up happening? So I think a lot of the media coverage of Sam Bankman-Fried fell into a trap that has sort of bitten journalists over and over and over again, which is that there are people in the tech industry who have really big personalities. They, you know, form this image of themselves that is very attractive to not only journalists, but investors, you know, politicians. Um, you know, Stan Bingman Fried was very talented, I think, at portraying himself as the sort of nerdy tech genius who slept on the beanbag and didn't brush his hair, you know, and, and that was like really attractive to people who were used to the archetype of the nerdy tech genius who is going to completely revolutionize things. And so, you know, when he started doing his basically PR work for FTX, you know, and he started buying airtime at the Super Bowl and, you know, cozying up to politicians, people, I think, just really bought into that. Um, and maybe, you know, were willing to overlook some things that could have been given some more scrutiny. So, you know, that's not to say that I called it all along and that, you know, from the start, I was like, oh, that guy looks like a fraud. Um, but, you know, I think there were things that were red flags that people really should have dug into, you know, journalists and I mean, myself as well. I didn't, you know, do a deep dive on Sam Bingman Freed before the uh, collapse. But, you know, I think there were always questions, for example, about the closeness between the FTX exchange and his Alameda Research um, sort of quant firm. You know, it's weird to have one guy running those two things when there's kind of an obvious potential for conflict of interest. And everyone in the crypto industry was kind of like, well, yeah, but, you know, it's crypto. People just do stuff like that. Um, and it, there was not a lot of, you know, journalists or, you know, just crypto personalities, I guess, questioning that. Um, and I think it, I think it's just a lesson basically to all of us to, to really you know, stop looking at crypto with that lens of, oh, it's just crypto. They're weird. You know, they don't have the same laws that um, banks or traditional financial institutions who are not based in the Bahamas, um, you know, have to comply with. And so whatever, you know, maybe you should, you know, maybe we should dig in a little bit more. Right. Like I think from the, the media perspective, and this is general, and there's obviously been really good journalism from mainstream journalists on crypto all along. Um, but it is kind of, sometimes I feel like it falls into that trap of either, you know, because it is kind of weird or different or you don't understand it, or maybe you don't, you have understood it and you don't think it's legit. It's, you don't actually devote the time of like, like you don't respect it as a, a force that really needs to be understood and investigated and picked apart because again, yeah, it's like, that thing over there. I think like video games as an industry, which is many, many times bigger than movies and books and all other forms of culture at this point, also get that a little bit from the mainstream press of like, oh, it's it's video games, so we don't need to investigate sexual harassment claims at their companies and stuff like that. Um, 
But I, I'm wondering, you know, maybe if we could kind of like step back a bit and if you, I'm curious sort of what, you know, how you would describe where we are right now when it comes to crypto and, and Web3. Um, obviously, you know, the highs of 2020, 2021 are down. A lot of um, the prices of these assets have gone down, but in some ways they're still higher than they've been, especially when you look at Bitcoin, some of the more um, mainstream of the crypto assets, they're they're still higher than they were when you look at previous um, peaks. You know, I, I've, I've looked back at stories written, I think, in 2017 when Bitcoin was like eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000, saying, this is wild and this is worth so much money and look at all these people buying Lamborghinis. And now we're sort of in the, the deepest of valleys with, but we're still around, you know, around that price, right? So I'm like, how do you describe where we are right now when it comes to this industry? Yeah, so I think, you know, I often say the deaths, the death of crypto has been overstated to some extent. You know, I think a lot of people experienced the highs of 2021 into 2022, where, you know, it was on the Super Bowl commercials and everyone was talking about it and maybe I should buy that board ape and all these different things. And now, it was a little bit passe to some people, or it's like a little cringe, uh, especially the NFTs. And so I think some people are like, all right, that's done. Crypto's dead. Let's talk about AI now, you know, or something like that. Um, and I think that's maybe unwise. Um, you can look at the history of crypto prices. Like, like, let's take Bitcoin for an example, because Bitcoin is, you know, the primary crypto asset still. It does this, right? It goes up. People get really excited about it for some reason. There's always something, you know, it's ICOs or it's, uh, you know, the Web3 or something like that. Crypto prices go up. People get really excited about it. Scams and fraud and, you know, grift proliferates. And then something happens and things crash back down and people lose interest. And then it happens again. And that's what's been happening for, I mean, Crypto has been around for, you know, almost 15 years at this point. That's what's happened, you know, over and over and over again. And I think that without an external force that would change that, I think that's likely to continue. Um, I also, you know, look at what's happening in the crypto space. I still obviously follow crypto very closely, and there's still a lot of VC money going into it. There are still politicians pushing crypto as you know, a liberatory force or as something that should be embraced by their constituents. Um, there are still people talking about how crypto is the solution to any problem that you can think of. You know, uh, remittances or uh, you know, people who are living under oppressive regimes are some of the really common ones. But you know, Uber on the blockchain and those types of ideas too are still coming out. <laughs> Um, I mean, you can look around South by Southwest, there's still crypto ads and, and projects that are uh, trying to make a dent. And so, you know, I think that just saying, okay, we're done, we can stop paying attention to it now, is probably unwise. I mean, what what do you think the next couple of years look like then for for all of that? Well, I mean, it's hard to predict, right? And I never try to predict the prices or anything like that because it's always way weirder than what you could expect. I mean, like, look at what happened, you know, over the past couple of days where the banks fell apart and Bitcoin went up. You know, everyone's like, oh, okay. Um, so, you know, I don't try to predict that kind of stuff. And I, you know, although I predict the general cycles, I have no idea what the time frame will look like. I think there's just too many variables there. Um, but I think that there are there's a lot of money in crypto still. You know, the VCs, for example, put so much money into crypto over the past couple of years. And I don't think they're just going to write off those investments. I think they're trying to keep the movement alive, you know, keep the interest alive. And when you've got really powerful, very wealthy entities, you know, Andreessen Horowitz and Sequoia and Pantera Capital and all these different companies really evangelizing crypto and with a very strong financial stake in it, you know, I think you have to be prepared that this is going to happen again um, and that, you know, the same frauds and the same scams that we've been seeing are going to continue to happen until something changes that would prevent them from. Do you think that the in the U.S. at least the we will get stricter regulation, maybe even to the point where this isn't something that mainstream people really participate in? 
It's hard to say. Um, I haven't seen a lot of potential for the U.S. legislature actually doing much <laughs> lately. Um, you know, I think just getting things done in uh, Congress is tough right now. Um, but we are seeing, you know, putting aside the possibility of new laws being introduced, we are seeing enforcement happening of, you know, from the SEC, from the FDIC, even, you know, from uh, various Department of Justice groups. And so I think that is going to continue. And I think that has the potential to really change how things are done in the industry. Um, you know, for example, we're seeing people backing off on staking products lately because the SEC has been, you know, pushing down, you know, against um, staking, various staking and lending platforms. And so, you know, there is change that happens there without, you know, new legislation being introduced. I have a little bit more um, optimism that those types of actions will cause change. Um, but I think, you know, with some of the really major collapses and, you know, real harm that has happened over the past year or two, um, you know, stablecoin collapses, massive centralized crypto bank collapses, um, there is more interest in Congress and, and uh, places like that to, you know, try to make sure that this isn't something that will be affecting constituents, that it won't be, you know, contagion to the banking system and things like that. I mean, with the SVB collapse on Friday and then Signature on Sunday, I mean, Signature obviously played a pretty key role within the crypto community. I mean, like, how do you think about Signature specifically and what happened there? Uh, maybe if you could just explain a little bit, like, its role in the crypto community and what that might mean going forward. Sure, yeah. So um, there were only a handful of U.S. banks that were, like, really game to take crypto clients. Um, one of them was Signature. Another was Silvergate, which is a bank that actually collapsed two days before Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and so with Silvergate and Signature both out of the picture, I think that's going to be very impactful on the crypto industry. Um, you know, like it or not, uh, as much as you might say, like one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, the crypto industry still really needs access to traditional finance and to U.S. banking rails. You know, people still need to be able to take their U.S. dollars and put them into the crypto space, you know, and buy Bitcoin or Ether or whatever. And without access to the U.S. financial system, that's challenging to do. And so... Um, you know, there were these banks that basically decided that they were going to service more crypto companies than, you know, most banks are willing to do. Uh, Silvergate was, you know, primarily a crypto bank at this point. Signature was not as exposed, but they still had quite a lot of crypto customers. Um, and so, um, you know, without them, I think the crypto industry is going to be having a tough time. They're going to either have to find other banks that are willing to work with them, which was already tough and will probably only be tougher after the collapses of these banks, or they're going to have to turn to some of the sort of, you know, shadier uh, shadow banks and those things. Um, it's kind of similar to how things were, I think, in sort of the 2017-2018 era, where a lot of crypto companies were having trouble accessing banking, and so they were working with these shadow banks, like, you know, Crypto Capital Corp and stuff like that, which ultimately ended in disaster there as well. Um, so, you know, I think it'll be really interesting to watch what happens, because we have these very mainstreamed crypto companies, you know, everyone knows what Coinbase is, everyone knows, you know, these different products, um, what's going to happen if they no longer, you know, if you can't just connect your bank account and transfer cash into your crypto account, I don't really know. Um, and what's going to happen for the new crypto products that don't have, you know, the, um, the, the footprint in the banking world that Coinbase already does, for example, and, and might not be able to get access to banking. Um, you mentioned AI, and, and it, it, it sounds like it's something people have been asking you about. Like, why why don't you pivot and write <laughs> about this, about generative AI, really? Because, you know, again, AI has been around for a long time. It's kind of a term that might mean slightly different things to slightly people. But obviously, we've had a huge burst of interest in the sort of cutting-edge technology that's been made available to people through OpenAI and, you know, now Microsoft, potentially Google, I think very soon and and so i mean what is your take on this sort of six months of 
intense attention when it comes to generative AI. And do you see any parallels to what you saw with crypto? Yes. Um, so it's interesting. Um, there are some very clear parallels, I think, between the crypto hype cycle of 2021 into 2022 and the you know large language model hype cycle that we're seeing right now. Um, but I think that when I say that, people sometimes read into it to mean that I think that, you know, AI and LLMs are worthless, you know, <laughs> or that I hate them or something like that. Um, I think some people have sort of established this picture of me in their head as like a Luddite who hates all technology, which is bizarre as someone who loves technology. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there are, I think while there are parallels in the hype cycle and the, the way that people are really just like, future casting about what AI could do and, and what they should be, you know, investing in because AI is the future, you know, which, which really rings of the Web3 sort of story. Um, I think there's a little more there there with AI. Um, you know, I have still yet to see much in the way of, you know, really strong use cases for crypto or blockchains beyond, you know, speculation and, and potentially getting rich quick. Um, whereas AI, you know, and LLMs are things that we use every day without really realizing it. Um, now I absolutely believe that there are strong, um, criticisms to be made of AI and the industry and its treatment in sort of the media and in just the public conscience. Um, but I, you know, I also think that, you know, the, the problems with AI are very much ethical problems. Um, the problems with crypto are absolutely ethical problems, but I think also technological problems to, to a larger extent. Um, so, you know, I, I do find the, the um, subject area very interesting, um, but I also think that, you know, the crypto industry is really interesting. And so it's not likely that I'm going to, you know, come out with AI is going just great.com because I frankly just don't have time to cover too. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I mean, I guess it becomes even more important to cover, to continue covering crypto as other people start talking and covering AI. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I started the project because I felt like there wasn't enough coverage of the crypto industry. So it'd be kind of weird for me to stop the project because I felt like there wasn't enough coverage of the crypto industry. Um, I mean, I think like sort of related to that, I mean, you know, you've meant you, you, you got into technology at a young age. Like I sort of, I don't know how you feel this, but I kind of categorize you as sort of, you know, in, in that kind of like, um, like web activists, like web, like sort of Cory Doctorow, we were talking about him earlier, like in that lineage of people who gets really, you know, into specific topics and sort of helps the rest of us maybe demystify it and definitely has a perspective that maybe you can agree with or can't or, or disagree with, but is sort of saying like, you know, this is what this technology is doing to us as a society and this is why it matters. Um, whereas like, I think, you know, living in Silicon Valley, there's obviously a lot of money when it comes to these technologies, both crypto and then before that social media, mobile, now we're looking at generative and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of the motivation for young people to get into these technologies is about, you know, there is an excitement, there's wanting to be at the cutting edge, but there's a huge financial motivation as well. Um, you know, there was a lot of money to be made. And also I think the way people talk about, you know, securing the bag and that kind of thing, like it, it is very, it's, it's framed in a very positive way about, you know, self-actualization and saying, you know, we live in a difficult society. Why not take your skills and your brain and go and get what, what's yours and get that money. And, um, whether the technology is neutral or positive or negative, I still see that as being a a large driving force, at least in the United States, for people to get into technology, to start companies, to get a PhD in AI and go down that road. I mean, like, how do you feel about that and how kind of, you know, American entrepreneurial capitalism, the lottery of venture capital kind of fits into our technology scene right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a software engineer. I started as a software engineer. I will probably be a software engineer again. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with building software. <laughs> I don't think that's a controversial statement. 
Um, but I think that, you know, it, there is a really tough incentive problem out there right now, which is that there's strong, strong financial incentives to just build, 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 you know, create the new thing, innovate, don't worry too much about what the ramifications are, you know, move fast, break things, that type of thing. Um, there is not a strong financial incentive to do the sort of critical work. Um, to say, wait a second, like maybe we should quickly study, you know, what the impacts of just releasing chat GPT on the world might be or something like that. Um, and that's really challenging. And I think that was part of the problem that I was identifying when I started doing this work was that, you know, the tech uh, journalists, obviously, you know, a lot of them didn't have the time or the expertise to really dig into the software to analyze crypto projects, you know, they didn't maybe have the economic background, the legal background. I mean, you need a ton of sort of broad knowledge to cover the crypto industry. Um, and they, you know, there was a lot of um, resources being put into saying, hey, you know, here's the press release, you know, here's the, um, the story that you can tell. And it was really easy for journalists to just get the information from the one source that was handing it to them and there weren't, you know, th there wasn't the counterparty. There weren't people being paid to hand them the information that said, hey, you know, maybe you should really dig into this claim that they're making and understand, you know, the motivations behind making it. And you should really understand, you know, that the technology is not doing what they say it's doing. Um, and I don't know what the solution is to that. You know, I would, I mean, I would love to see, you know, more funding for people doing critical research of any technology, not just in a self-serving way. I mean, I would love for people to pay me money to do more of what I'm doing. That'd be great. But, um, you know, I think that it's really critical that there are people like Cory Doctorow or Tim Neat, you know, doing AI research or, or whoever is out there, you know, to, to actually be able to take the time and really dig into it without having to always be chasing the product release or the headline or, you know, the, the VC investment, the seed round. Um, because, you know, it's, it's really unbalanced to have, you know, people just moving in that one direction and then having just like, you know, nights and weekends folks like myself, you know, just like tearing this stuff apart because we feel like we have to, but not because there's that much, you know, actual reward for doing so. Um, that was one thing that really confused me when I first started doing the research that I was doing before I quit my job, before I, you know, started my Substack. People were like, you're just being paid to, to criticize crypto. And I was like, by who? Like, who is out there? They were like, oh, the big banks. I was like, are you kidding me? Look at what the big banks are doing. They're shilling crypto. You know, but um, there is this sort of belief that there is just money in it for, for people to do the kind of work that I'm doing. And it's not just raining from the sky, let me say. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, do you, do you think that there are, you know, I mean, I guess you're now associated with an academic institution, obviously, which has d traditionally, you know, paid money, sometimes from private sources, sometimes from public sources for research that you know, at least the stated goal is to sort of help us understand our world better. There's journalism, which does have a business model, which is sort of shaky over the last 15 years, but, you know, we're still here. But, I mean, do you see, um, and I think, you, you know, mentioned Tim, Tim Neek Gebru, former Google research in, uh, ethics uh, researcher who was actually fired after sort of speaking out very publicly, criticizing Google's path when it came to AI and large language models. And, and she's gone and sort of begun her own group to do some of this work as well. But I mean, do you have ideas for how, you know, this kind of work can be done sustainably and also scaling it up? I wish I had the magic solution. I mean, I think there needs to be public funding for tech research, honestly. I think that's just critical. Um, you know, there is such a clear public impact of tech development. I don't understand why there isn't public funding of research into it, both into developing it and into, you know, analyzing its impacts. I think that would be a huge change. Um, maybe not a politically popular one, but it's one that I think would be very important. Yeah, like national research council grants or something like yeah that. i mean well look where the internet came from right there was public funding that went into that um i don't you know i don't understand necessarily why we've moved away from that model um i mean you are sort of like a a wick an og wikipedian and still identifies way cooler editor. than it actually it's is. pretty cool <laughs> i mean 
the you're, y'all are having your big conference in Singapore this year, right? I don't know if you're going to that, but yeah, we'll yeah. See. <laughs> um, those are also very cool conferences. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm fascinated by Wikipedia because it is still the website I use the most, it just in my free time and in my my work to start my research process. Not I'm not citing Wikipedia, but I, I mean, like I directly, <laughs> I, I I probably would, but they won't let me. But um, like I, it's one of the websites still that people spend you know it's like one of the top five or like the fifth or sixth biggest website in the world essentially it's never been for profit it's always it, it's somehow managed to mostly escape the culture wars up to this point uh, i know there was like a conservative pedia for a while but like you don't see wikipedia's you know board being held in front of congress yet you know to answer why they're so biased which is something that you know journalism has been you know, gotten into that. Tech obviously has gotten into that. Like, what is, like, what what do you think we can learn from Wikipedia? And, like, are you worried about Wikipedia being able to maintain the role that it has going forward? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of some of the more utopian Web3 projects could learn a lot from Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is like the utopian web project. Like, you know, when people were beginning, you know, beginning the web and talking about what the web could do, I think Wikipedia was like the dream, right? Like that anyone could edit it, anyone could access it. You know, there was free information. And as long as you had the Internet connection, you would be able to see it. Um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing. I think it's critical. Um, and so, you know, I think we really need to look at projects like Wikipedia and go, could another project like this start today? You know, if there was a, you know, a similarly innovative product that, that launched, could it succeed under these circumstances? And if not, why not? And how can we make sure that it could? Um, but I think that there are also just a lot of questions that we need to consider when it comes to products like Wikipedia that are, you know, just challenging to grapple with. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the funding is a really difficult one. You know, it's like, can we, should, you know, such critical parts of our um, world, you know, our education, our journalism, you know, lawmakers use it all the time, you know, should that be something that is just funded by donations and edited by people who do it in their spare time? Um, but that's something that I've seen, you know, Web3 projects asking a lot. You know, and that's actually one of the first things that got me interested in some of these like Web3 projects was I kept seeing people being like, we should have a Web3 Wikipedia. You know, it was like the big idea. It's like we, we're going to pay the editors to edit and, you know, we'll reward them in tokens. And it was just a very interesting um, thing to see because it felt like the people who were making those suggestions had never edited Wikipedia in their lives <laughs> um, and sort of didn't understand that there were like very complicated incentive structures in place that, you know, suddenly paying all the editors might not actually be a universally good thing for the project. Um, that's a bit of a tangent, but. Yeah, so I mean, I think that critically, you know, we just need to look at the web that we want, you know, the utopian ideas that we still have around openness and privacy and, um, you know, connection and things like that. And then really examine, like, what do we have to do to the web that exists today so that we are moving in that direction? And some people will say crypto, you know, some people will say we should just have blockchains and we should, you know, decentralize everything and everything you do, you should get paid for somehow, um, you know, and you can own your own data, whatever that even means. Um, but then there are people like me, you know, who think that that might actually move uh, the web in the wrong direction, you know, that financializing everything you do online is not always a good thing and that, you know, making everything that you do in your free time into your second job is maybe, you know, just leaning into the capitalism dystopia that we are sort of hurtling towards and not necessarily pushing back against it. So, you know, I think there's kind of a reckoning that needs to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, it's kind of interesting because we were just talking about how do you make, how do you sort of support, um, you know, important research or critical perspectives, you know, that are t going maybe counter to the, pl the places that are backed by money and but then you know now you're you, you know you're, you're talking about what do we lose when we you know pay every wikipedia editor for per article or per word or something so yeah i mean like like do you think that that sort of 
open source original collaborative dream of the web can come back like in an era of big tech i mean you know we talk a lot about crypto we talk a lot about vc startups but obviously the the people who really have power on the web are the biggest tech companies that are you know public companies that have a profit motive and and sort of have walled off and control huge swaths of of the internet and and you know i i see them as sort of you know the big dogs and ones who may be most in the way of a more um people driven web but how do you think about that yeah so i think i mean i think this gets back to something that i find myself repeating over and over and over again which is well two things one there's not a technological solution to every problem um, you can't necessarily code your way out of some of these systemic issues, right? You can't just slap a blockchain on something and it will just equitize everything, you know, decentralize everything and fix it all. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, you basically need to focus on the problem rather than jumping directly to the solution. And that's another thing that we see a lot in crypto is people are like, blockchain is the solution. It's like, to what? And they're like, um that, you know, Wikipedia or, you know, Uber or dog walking on the blockchain. Um, and, you know, I think that if we look at what you just asked, which is, you know, like going back to sort of that question of like, well, should Wikipedians be paid for their edits or something like that? You know, should people be rewarded for their labor? Should people be able to do things like edit Wikipedia? And I think the problem there is that like right now, there are a lot of people who don't just have the free time to edit Wikipedia, right? They have a job, they have two jobs, they're caring for their loved, you know, their elderly loved ones, they have kids, they, you know, whatever it is, they don't have just like the time to sit down and write a Wikipedia article. Um, and I think everyone should have that time. And I don't necessarily think that the way to make sure that everyone has that time is by making Wikipedia into your second job or your third job or your fourth job or your eighth job, along with playing your video games, which are now play to earn, apparently, you know, and all these things, like make that into your job. I don't think that's necessarily the solution. I think the solution is making sure that people have the space to you know, do whatever it is. I don't think everyone should have to edit Wikipedia. I think they should do whatever they think is, you know, important and contributes to society, you know, create art, you know, write music, um, edit Wikipedia, you know, do whatever it is you want to do, you know, participate in your DAO for all I care. Um, but I think that the fact is that, you know, we have a society where people just don't have the space to do those types of things that would really enrich the society that we have and would move us towards a society that we want. Um, and so instead of saying like, well, you know, people just need more money, so we have to make everything into a money making exercise, you know, maybe we could address the, the cause of that. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, it's not a satisfying answer. It's not like, well, I developed this new software that was going to make sure everyone has, you know, enough to survive. I wish I could. If I could, I would. But um, the solution is really societal change, policy change, you know, legal change, um, which isn't sexy. It's not, you know, I'm not going to do a big release, but, you know, I would love to see that happen. <laughs> um, I think we have 12 minutes for questions. I'm not sure if the questions are going to appear on the screen, um, but if they are, this would be a good time for them to appear. <laughs> um, but... We can also just do the microphone questions if people are, want to do that. Does anyone want to ask a question? I do. Yeah. Do you want to go to that microphone and, and ask it and introduce yourself quickly? Hopefully it works. Yeah, I'm Bruce Sterling. Hi. Hello. Um, so um, in this mess that you've been covering over the past couple of years there, you know, a kind of ceaseless torrent of disasters, large and small. Which one do you think is like the most human tragedy? The most human tragedy. I mean, which ones do you feel like pity and sympathy for? I mean, who 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 has suffered worst for the least objective reason? Who's the who's the most tragic figure in this in this maelstrom? That's cheery. <laughs> Um, you know, I actually, I will say that I think there is sometimes a perception that I'm like laughing at everyone that loses money in crypto. And I, I would actually say that there are very few where I'm like, 
<laughs> you know, and I have there no are some. Where there you... are a couple, and I love them. They're the ones that I live for. But most of them, there are very sympathetic people, even if they're maybe not the most likable people. It's like it sucks when you lose, you know, a significant portion of your finances. Um, but there were, you know, there have been some where it is really heart-wrenching to see. I think the ones that really come to mind are some of the projects like Celsius, which went under this uh, this summer, where it wasn't necessarily the like moonshot crypto bros, you know, the like Dogecoin Lamborghinis that, you know, the, those guys who were losing their money. They're a little bit less sympathetic in my opinion. Um, no offense if any of you are in the audience. Um, But there were a lot of just like really average people who put their money into those projects because they were being misled. You know, they were being told by Celsius's management that this is just like a bank. It's safer than a bank in some cases, they were saying. Um, You know, you can just take your money that you would put in a savings account where it wouldn't earn any interest and you can put it with us and we'll treat it just like a bank, but we won't treat you badly like the banks are treating you. And, you know, you'll be able to make, you know, some amount of interest that you weren't able to make in traditional finance. And that really spoke to some people who needed the money. And so, you know, when Celsius went bankrupt and when customers were unable to access their funds, what people did is they started writing letters to the bankruptcy judge to basically plead for their money back. Um, And these told their stories around, you know, I am... 80 years old, this was my retirement money. And I was told that this was a way that I could not only keep it in the bank, but actually make a return on it. You know, there were parent, there were single parents, there were people who had very sick family members. You know, there were there were really like real people with real stories who were not just taking, you know, their extra cash and gambling it on a shit coin or whatever. It was like the money that they needed to live. And so I think those were really the most impactful and, and really evidence of the fact that crypto was entering the mainstream. You know, it wasn't just the very technical people or the very, you know, the, the people who are really into like risky financial projects. This was just people who thought that, you know, they were being sold something that could actually change their financial situation. Um, there's a question that got most of the upvotes, which, I mean, we've talked about this before, and it, I'm sure it's probably one of the biggest questions that you get, which is beyond the hype, where is Web3 actually being used successfully? So I think that depends very much on your definition of Web3. Um, so some people will use Web3 much more broadly just to describe like decentralized web products, for example, which I don't, I don't like that like the D-Web is being lumped into Web3 because I think the crypto part of it is actually a very critical part of the definition. But I do think there are decentralized web products that are, that are um, being developed that are very interesting and might hold promise. Um, and people will call them Web3. I might not. Um, but those are really where I see it. And, you know, I think it's really just a lot of the development around the fringes. You know, there are, there's technology involved with some of these crypto products that is not necessarily the blockchain itself, but some of the stuff around it. And some of that is really interesting. I mean, I think also the, you know, we've talked a little bit before about crypto's role. Like one of the, the original use cases was um, activism and doing things that governments don't want you to do that are good, that help people, you know, avoiding, uh, communicating, sharing money without authoritarian governments being able to stop that, or democratic ones for that matter. Um, I mean, how do you, and I, I, I think you probably um, associate with some of those people and maybe, you know, see them as allies, but also might have very different opinions on the technology and its value like how do you think about that space yeah so for example using bitcoin to like fund whistleblowers or something like that is like you know something that comes up a lot and people are like do you hate that and it's like no i think that's great i think it's wonderful that people are able to get funding in very difficult situations um the same thing around like you know funding people who are in you know really tough situations because of like uprisings or war or whatever it might be i think that's wonderful um but i think that those very individual use cases of like, look at this one woman who like fled the Taliban with her Bitcoin. Like that's wonderful and I love it, but I don't see that as a strong argument for like crypto is the future of the web, right? Like those are two very different things. 
Um, and so, you know, where we are able to help people out of really difficult situations and enable, you know, whistleblowing and things that might be unpopular with the government, I think that is good. Um, but I think that, you know, coming up with a, an actual, like, scalable solution to those types of problems is not going to be Bitcoin. You know, I don't think that everyone, well, we saw this in, you know, Afghanistan, when people broadly started using crypto to try to flee that regime, the Taliban cracked down on it. Right. And that's what happens over and over and over again. And yet people sort of use it as like the example of the way that Bitcoin is going to solve everything. Um, so, you know, I think that it's really critical to sort of see that like something that I, you know, don't I don't see that much promise in the technology. I think a lot of the speculation is harmful, but that doesn't mean that there aren't good use cases of it. It's just a matter of like, does the good outweigh the bad? And does the, you know, do those individual use cases justify a lot of the crazy, you know, hype and and ideas that people are starting to really advocate um, with a technology that's not often not well suited. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the Arab Spring and the role that social media played there and, and sort of the excitement, the ideas that, you know, social media could be sort of a democratizing force and a way to escape gatekeepers and bottlenecks of information. And now, obviously, governments have learned how to use social media. Authoritarian governments have used social media to get messages out there to suppress dissent in, in their own way. So I guess it's, you know, tech can be used either way. But I mean, rel related to that, that one of the other um, upvoted questions was about El Salvador, um, which has, you know, very famously aggressively adopted um, crypto infrastructure sort of into the apparatus of the state. I'm, I'm not sure how much you time you spend thinking or writing or investigating El Salvador, but how do you feel about what's going on there? Yeah, so the situation of Bitcoin in El Salvador is kind of a tragedy, I think. Um, you know, their government, which is basically a fascist government at this point, um, decided suddenly that they were going to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, and they sort of foisted it on the people in El Salvador. Um, and it's not gone very well, um, as, as my website might say. Um, you know, it's not really being used. Um, the, the, the use cases around remittances and things like that have not been particularly successful. Um, most of the, you know, Salvadorians are, are forced to use or are supposed to use this wallet called the Chivo wallet, which was very poorly implemented and through which people have lost a lot of money. Um, so I think it's been sort of a, you know, a disaster, honestly, in El Salvador, but, you know, as is kind of common in the crypto world, when you've really invested a lot of money into something, it's hard to just like turn away from that. And people become very ideological about it. And I think that's sort of what's happened among the upper echelons of the El Salvador government is that, you know, the president is extremely invested in Bitcoin and does not want to let go of it. And so he has been sort of sinking money into it continuously and, and coming up with these ideas that are sort of like you know, volcano bonds and creating, you know, Bitcoin city and all this stuff while the, the people in El Salvador are really suffering and, and having, you know, a pretty tough time with things. Um, my apologies. I think we have time for just probably one more. So if you want to ask the question at the mic. Yeah, Molly, first of all, thanks for the, the work you're doing. I think it's really important. Um, my question is just uh, around the idea of when your brand is so closely, your personal brand, is so closely associated with a specific viewpoint, does, does that give you the freedom to, to kind of like pivot as, you know, we talked about you being a journalist in a sense, but, you know, your kind of voice is so closely identified to, to finding, you know, and, and there's a lot to find, specific, you know, a specific angle on Web3. And I just was curious, like, how how you think about that, where you start to feel like an audience kind of locks you into one viewpoint. And because I just, I'm curious about how that applies to lots of other things. Like there's such a need for that, but then people can be so tied to their, 
their viewpoints, there's no, you know, conversation and dialogue? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, when I first started doing this, nobody really knew who I was. And I was just writing stuff. And, and you know, people liked what I wrote. Um, but, but, you know, more recently, I've been discovering how sometimes people will sort of assume my viewpoints on things in, in very interesting ways. I see it a lot with AI, um, you know, where people assume that I just hate AI, all of it, whatever it is. I just hate it, you know, and it's like, what would make you think that? And they're like, well, you don't like crypto. And that's the other thing is people assume that I hate anything that is at all related to crypto. And I'll say something like, you know, it's good that people use Bitcoin to flee the Taliban. And they're like, oh, really? You like Bitcoin? It's like, no, it's possible to have nuance here. Um, you know, I guess this is sort of the Twitter world that we live in where it has to be like Bitcoin bad or like, you know. Um, but it, yeah, so I think it's tough, you know, people will sort of box you into certain viewpoints, but I think that it is possible to also sort of try to push through that and, and present those nuanced views. You know, like I wrote an essay a, a while ago about anti-crypto toxicity, where I believed that, you know, there was this move in the sort of group of people who are not into crypto, you know, they're skeptical of it, they're critical of it, where it was actually developing some of the same sort of toxicity that we were seeing among, you know, Bitcoin maximalists and things like that, where, you know, you would, it, like, it was right around when Twitter rolled out the hexagon profile pictures where people would get their NFT and they put it into their profile picture and it showed up as an NFT so every, or as a hexagon so everyone knew that it was an NFT. And you would see people on Twitter being like, shut up, Hexagon. You know, and it's just like, that's not moving the conversation forward. Like, you don't need to write off every view that that person has because they have a Hexagon profile picture. Like, it is possible for me to talk to someone who thinks crypto is the next big thing and it's going to revolutionize everything. And we actually have a lot of common ground a lot of the times because we, we identify the same problems, right? Like, I don't, I'm not out here saying like, I love big banks. I love Facebook. I love huge tech companies. Like, it's not that. We have the same problems. It's just we disagree on the solutions. Um, so I think just sort of trying to keep, you know, that nuance there to avoid getting sort of radicalized into positions that are just black and white um, is really important. And you know, it might box me in that I'm seen as critical of technology, but I am critical of technology. And I think that's a good thing. I think being critical is important, you know, and being skeptical is important. Um, and so, you know, if people assume that I hate all AI, that's fine. And I can, you know, I can argue over it, but I can also say, well, maybe there are some things we should be looking at with AI. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Molly. That's great. Thank you.